So letters of recommendation. It's the end of junior, junior year, junior year. And um, think about who you might want to write those letters. A lot of times it's a good idea to ask an academic teacher. By academic teacher, I mean math, English, science, social studies, or world language. Because these colleges want to know what kind of student are you? Can you handle the academic rigor of being in college classes? So an academic teacher is, is a good person. Another good person, if you are applying for a particular major or you're applying for a particular program like music or theater, um, you may have a teacher that you worked with really closely. So also, who knows you best is important. Creating your colleges of where you're going to apply. That should be kind of an ongoing process until you solidify that at the beginning of your senior year. Also, this process, while well, I said earlier that it can be done for free, I'm just going to, I'm going to take that back now. <laughs> there are a few costs involved. You do have to pay for testing, and you do have to pay admission application fees, and then um, there's usually a deposit for housing. Now, if um, all of these costs, you know, tend to add up, so it's important to set a budget for yourself. Or if you're in a position where you think you might be eligible for some fee waivers, there are fee waivers for taking the ACT and SAT. There's fee waivers for um, submitting your admission application. So if you think you might be eligible for that, talk to your high school counselor. Usually they're the ones that sign off on those um, so that you can get those. And then when you're thinking about college applications, um, you actually don't begin doing that until you've completed your junior year. Some applications aren't even active till August of your senior year, but there's things that you can do before then to get ready. And how many applications should you do? <laughs> what did you say? Five to six. Five to six. That's a, that's a good number too. As many as you want to, you know, within some reason. Usually, I recommend six to ten applications. You know, if you do less than six. You may not have as many options as you'd like to choose from in the spring of your junior year. If you do more than 10, that can add a lot of cost. And if you do enough research, you should find enough schools within up to 10 that are going to fit you and be good places for you to go. All right, so these are the things you're actually going to need to start your applications. So you're going to need a social, your social security number, your high school code, which you can get that from your high school counselor or find it on a website I have later in here. You're gonna need a copy of your transcript and your senior schedule. You're gonna need your test scores and your resume. So I have another quick short video to show you on this. And the timeline, or not the timeline, but the green handout that has all the different parts of the application, I adopted that from this website. College Board. How many of y'all know College Board? Been to that big future. This is a really good one to help you with the college application process. So, and this one also has a bunch of really good short videos that you can look at. So this has all the pieces of your application with some more tips on those if you want to look at that later on your own time. When colleges are trying to put together their enrolled class each year, the students from all of their applications who they will admit and enroll, if students would think of it as trying to have a successful party, and if you're having a party, you don't want to invite all of the same kinds of people. You don't want to have just loud, obnoxious people at your party. You want to have some of those people. You want to have some quiet people. You want to have people who want to play games and people who want to have conversations. Same thing happens when a college admissions dean is trying to bring together a new class. They want all kinds of different students. So they do want those brilliant 4.0 valedictorians who are really going to excel academically. And they also want students who are going to be good academic students, but are also fun and going to be involved in a lot of activities. And students who are musicians and students who are athletes and everything in between. So if students would think to themselves, all these things that I've done, somebody out there is going to be interested in me as a person and want me as part of their community. It may be there's some colleges who aren't going to want the students, and that's fine too, but there are plenty of colleges who will. Students obsess about where they're not going to get in instead of really being excited about the places that take them. 
Okay. So I just want to reiterate one of the points that she made is that you know this is not a judgment really about you. There is going to be a place for everyone. Probably multiple places is the hope. You know that you can go to college if you want to go to college, and there are colleges that will accept you no matter your academic record. Now she talks about some of the high achieving students, but there's colleges for everybody. So just know, you know, yes, a good academic record helps for sure, and it helps with getting scholarships and all that um, that goes with that. Um, but just know that there are there is a place that will want you as part of their community, and probably multiple places. So. The common application I want to talk about, you have a copy of that in front of you, paper copy. And of course, this is actually online, but I couldn't show you really the whole thing online very easily, and I wanted you to have a copy to take with you. But the common application is a nice way to apply to a bunch of different schools using one application. There are over 500 schools that accept it, and um, there are seven schools now in our state that take it. I have that on another slide. And um, so this is a nice one to use. If you have three or more colleges on your list that you're applying to that take this, it's worth it to use it. If you have less than that, a lot of times they'll have their own application that you can use, and sometimes that's easier. My guess is you're going to be doing the common application and maybe a couple other applications that are specific to those colleges. So I wanted you to see what this is like. What are they asking and why are they asking it? So um, this is a little bit about Common App and why to use it. I just went over kind of all that stuff. Those are the seven Colorado schools that use it. And they want to get to know you. They want to know what motivates you. They want to learn what you're going to contribute on their campus. And they want to understand where you're coming from. You know. Um, and so it's best to do your you know, answer as much as you can on the application. If you don't understand a question, ask somebody. Um, but I'm going to go over every piece so hopefully you understand what they're trying to get at and why they're asking it. So the first page that you can look at is pretty straightforward. You know, your demographics, kind of your, you know, your name and all of that stuff. So one of the questions on there, mailing address versus permanent address. What's the difference? Why would they ask both of those things? Uh, because your mailing address is where your mail is going to be going to, like your, say if you get a bill, it's going to go to that specific address compared to your home address, mm -hmm. that is where you live, that is pretty yeah. much. Yep, that's, that's a good in distinction too. Another thing that happens sometimes is you might be living somewhere temporarily and so your mailing address will be where you're getting your mail at that moment in time. And the permanent address is you know, where someone can always get a hold of you. A lot of times when you start college, your permanent address is going to be your parents' address or whoever you were living with before you went to college. And then your mailing address is going to be your college address. And the next thing it asks about your future plans. It asks you, you know, what are your academic interests? They might ask what major you want to do. and then. Um, Decision plan, what do you think that means? That's a question on there. There are several different ways to apply to, to schools. So you might be applying, and I'll go over these different types in, in a later slide. You might be applying early decision. You might be applying regular decision. Um, and there's a few more that I'll go over. Um, when you're trying to put down your major, that may make a difference and it may not. It depends on the school. And so at some schools, certain majors have stricter admission requirements. So, you know, for um, example, I know there's um, NYU, their school of business, really difficult to get into. But there's other schools within NYU that you can apply to that are a little bit easier to get into. So, um, a lot of times, undecided is just fine. A lot of times, most of the students that are coming in, especially to our state schools, are undecided. So, um, you know, be honest about it, first and foremost, and then find out, you know, does it make a difference? 
in, in my admission, whether I claim a major or not. And you can ask the college that. One of the things you'll need to get really good at in this process is emailing those college reps or talking to them when they come to your school or going to see your high school counselor. There's a hundred questions that can come up in this process, so don't be afraid to ask them. And then it asks, do you intend to apply for need-based financial aid? So what does that mean? Go ahead. I had to do all this. Uh, pretty much need based financial aid is are you really going to need the help from a financial aid? Do you have to apply for FAFSA? Do you need to apply for COF? Or do you need to pretty much get a bond from that school in a way? Yeah, are you going to need outside money for college to be able to go, basically? You know, a lot of us probably don't have parents that can just write checks. I didn't. So I applied for need based financial aid. And then, um, so it's okay to say yes, there's nothing wrong with that. And then they'll know that's something you're looking for. You'll need to do the FAFSA, the free application for federal student aid, or any other financial aid form that they ask you to do. Um, and that's in, indi in addition to your admission application, that's a separate application. And then they ask about citizen, well, you know, there's a few other questions, but I think most of those are explanatory, unless anyone has a question about those. Um, they ask about your citizenship status. So depending on what state you're applying to, if you um, are a U.S. citizen or not a U.S. citizen, sometimes that can affect your tuition cost. And so, or sometimes it can affect your federal aid, um, uh, your fed financial federal aid eligibility. So, you know, again, something you just need to be honest about. A lot of times colleges will provide aid for non-U.S. citizens. So just be prepared to answer that question, and that's something you're going to need, need to be straightforward about. And find out how that college helps or doesn't help non-U.S. citizens if you're a non-U.S. citizen. And you might find places that are more friendly that can help with that. And then it asks, um, oh, this is where I get into the different types. Okay, because that was one of the questions, decision plan. Let's watch this one. It's not very long There are three different ways you can submit your college applications for early admissions consideration. In this video, we'll look at each option so you can understand how they work and if one of them is ideal for you. First, let's discuss. I'm sorry, that's not. That's not okay. Actually, no, let's stop this because I think we're going to get short on time. So I'm just going to explain this. There are three different okay, ways you can submit your call. Have another video later. All right, so early decision. This is one that is, you only apply to one school early decision. And this is a school that you have fallen in love with. And this, if this school will have you, you are more than happy to go there. You're not looking anywhere else. It's kind of like you're ready to get married to this school. You don't care about any of those others out there. So early decision is a good plan for students that really want that one school. And in some places, applying early decision increases your chances of being accepted. That's pretty rare. Not many students do that. If that college does say yes, guess what? You're, you're bound to go to that school. You know, the, usually the only way out is if you don't get the financial aid you want, but usually if, if you get accepted that way, then you're going. And then, um, and that's kind of nice, you know, to have that relief if you have a school like that that you really like. Early action. If it's just regular early action, you can apply to a lot of schools early action, which is a good way to go too. Remember I said early in this game is better. So um, there are some that are restrictive to um, where you can only do one early action school, but then you're not tied to them. You can actually, um, you know, you're not bound to go to that school um, if it's just single choice early action. Rolling admission. Typically, the lesser selective schools are using rolling admission. That means that you apply, and within you know two weeks to a month, you're probably going to get an answer. Sometimes even sooner than that. 
And then regular admission, there's usually one regular deadline, and you're applying by that deadline. And some schools will have both, like Boulder, CSU, they both have early action and regular admission, and um, you just get notified earlier, usually when you apply when you apply early. Sometimes it gives you a little bit of an advantage, but sometimes it's just knowing ahead of time. Okay, so next it's going to ask about your background a little bit more. It talks about citizenship, but it's going to ask about your um, racial background, all those things, and why do you think they want to know that stuff? Yeah, <laughs> they want to know, you know, like the lady said, they're, they're putting together a party. They want people of diverse background so that we can all learn from each other. So they want to know, you know, where you're coming from and, and what, what's your family history. So they're going to ask some of those questions. And as you guys probably know, sometimes there's extra aid available. But a lot of times, you're not going to get it just by checking a box. You've got to go do separate applications or do some research and figure out what you need to do. Next. Okay, keep going. I'm going over these answers. Oh, another thing they might want to know is if your parents attended. That's one of the questions. Sometimes that can help. Um, you know, they have alumni scholarships. First generation is also a type of diversity. You know, you bring a unique perspective to their campus if you're the first in your family to go to school. Um, they also want to know about other languages. You know, those are those are things they're interested in. So the next section is education. So it asks, what it, you know, secondary school. What is that? Your high school. Yep, you guys all shared that. Well, not all of you, but some of you shared that earlier. So your high school, you're going to put that in there. And any other high schools you've been to. And you need to know their codes. So there's going to be a link on this application where you can find the school code. You can also, you know, just Google that, high school codes. And there's um, websites where you can look those up. Or you can find it a lot of times on the high school website on the counseling web page. And then if you've attended any colleges, it's going to ask that. So if you took, you know, something like a CU Succeed class, AVP, or um, anything like that, if you were on a college campus or you got college credit for something you did, you're going to want to list that college. And they want to know what kind of program that was. So um, it'll tell you CO is college campus, um, or if it's CU Succeed and you did it at your school campus, then you're going to fill in that box. The next thing they're going to want to know more about is your academics. How many of your schools don't rank? How many of you even know that answer to that? Some of you may not know. But OK. So some schools don't carry class rank, and some schools do. Class rank is who's got the number one GPA in the class all the way down to who's got the lowest GPA in the class. And that's how they figure out who's valedictorian, who's salutatorian, that sort of thing. And some schools will give scholarships based on rank, so they want to know your rank. Um, and if your school doesn't rank, they don't hold that against you. You know, usually they have other things they use to substitute for that rank calculation. So, um, other thing they want to know about is your testing. So this is another thing you can be doing if you're if you're not ready to start filling applications yet. Be working on your testing and your test prep because your test scores do make a difference. And then you're going to want to put in any special honors or awards or extracurricular activities you did. This is kind of your moment to brag about yourself. And that's why I have resume listed on that green sheet as one of the things, um, I think it's on the green sheet. If not, I talk about it. <laughs> uh, one of the things to have ready when you're doing these applications so it's all there at your fingertips. All right. Be specific as you can. You know, if there's room to put a verb in there and say what you actually did, you know, that just helps them to know more about what you actually did as part of these groups versus just making a laundry list of things that you did. And try to you remember to include everything. You know, don't leave anything off. Think outside of the box. There's all these different categories up here um, that you can pull from. You know, and sometimes you forget. So 
ask your parents, ask your family or your, your friends. You know, there might have been something you did with friends that you forgot about. So list as much as you can, but start with the thing that is most important to you, the thing that was most meaningful, that you contributed the most, that, that you enjoyed, and then work your way down from there. Because you may not have room for everything. All right, essays. Someone said that essays were an obstacle. And they can be for a lot of students. You know, putting stuff down in writing isn't always easy to do, especially when it comes to some of these questions they ask. Do you guys see those on the essay part? They ask, you know, some pretty personal things, you know, and it's we're not used to talking about ourselves a lot of times. So um, I do have a tip for you on this if you want to go to that College Board video link there. This might help you when it comes to your essays. If you scroll down, I think it's towards the bottom. Yep, the same lady there. The college essay is a stumbling block and the procrastination factor for most students. And they're worried because they think they have to write the answer to how to solve world peace and hunger. And if they haven't done all those things, then there's no way anyone will admit them. Um, the reality is this is supposed to be a chance for the reader to understand who you are as a person, to bring you out of that manila file. I tell students to ask the people who know the best, their friends and their family members, what are the stories you tell about me? And listen to what they tell you. Everybody has a story that they tell about you. You need to hear those stories, and somewhere in there is the kernel of a really great essay. So ask people stories they tell about you. Basically, this is your chance to tell your story. Most of your application is kind of hard facts, um, but this is the one place where they really get to know you as a person. So um, you know, make sure you take the time to really work on this piece. It shouldn't take you one night. It should take you, you know, a few weeks and sometimes even months later you'll go back to it and tweak it. Because um, for common application, this is the nice thing, you're having one main essay. And um, for other applications, you might have to tweak your, your essay to fit what their prompt is asking for. But um, you can have one great essay to start off with for common app. So this is another thing that you could be doing even before you start your application. You know, this could be something that you put on your action plan. I'm going to draft an essay by this date. I'm going to have my English teacher look over it by this date. I'm going to make changes based on what my English teacher or my parent or my counselor or any other teacher you trust said. So that's another good one for your action plan if you don't have anything on that. So um, essay, also just relax. You know, Sometimes we get all wound up about this. Just start putting something down. And remember, it's a draft. You're going to keep working on it and refining it. Oh, that's right. <laughs> so here's the, the next section. And this, we're almost done. Discipline history and signature. So why do they want to know about this stuff? Yeah, they might want to know about any instances of ac academic dishonesty. That's a big deal to colleges. You know, and stuff happens. Um, they want to know because they're looking for good community members. And let's say you have something on there, your discipline history. Like I said, you know, that, that stuff happens. Then what? What are you going to do about it? Right, exactly. That would be bad news if you said, nope, I don't have anything on my discipline history, I'm all good. And then your counselor fills out their form and they says, oh, yep, something happened in junior year. That doesn't look good. Do you have something you want to say about that? Okay, so um, you're going to explain what happened and what you learned from it. You know, they don't expect everybody to be perfect. They know that stuff happened. And so what they want to hear about is what you learned from that instance, and most likely they're not going to hold it against you. I mean, I, when I worked in college admissions, really the only ones that were red flags for us is when a student didn't admit or um, kind of blamed other people, didn't take responsibility for their part of it, and 
and didn't talk about how they grew from this experience. Um, or if it was something, you know, where we felt like it would endanger other people in the community, then we usually have a meeting and talk about it in person. So know that that's not a deal breaker. You just need to talk about it and be honest. And then you have to say that everything's true. So make sure that you are honest on your application. And you know what? If you feel like you don't you know, have a good application, don't worry about that either. Don't feel like you need to make stuff up to look good. <laughs> a lot of times you just need some help pulling out, what should I put here? I don't know what to do. And so that's where talking to your family, talking to your counselor or your teachers can help. Okay, so when can you start? We already kind of talked about, you know, you can't really fill out the application until um, fall of senior year, and that's number one on your green sheet here. But there's some other things that you can be working on. So the Common App goes live the August 1st of your senior year. But you can always be doing these other things, looking for what colleges take the Common App, looking for what colleges you want on your list, and creating your list. That's a whole other workshop that we don't have time to get into. But And you can be looking at these other things. If you're going to apply to something like, um, All right, if we have time, we'll come back to this one. But when you're asking for letters of recommendation, I say end of junior year, because you want to give those teachers, those counselors, as much notice as possible um, so that they can write a good letter. If you're writing up to them and your deadline is November 1 and it is October 30th, we most just, likely we just laugh. Ah. <laughs> you're probably not going to get the same quality letter if you had asked at the end of your junior year, or even, you know, maybe April, May, early May of your junior year. Because those teachers have had you for a whole year and they'll be able to write about you, um, you know, with, from all that experience. So give them notice and always write a thank you note. This serves a couple purposes. One, you definitely, the relationships in this process can be very helpful for you. So you always want to thank people that have helped you um, if, whether that's your counselor or a college rep you talk to, that goes a long way to say thank you. And to put something down in writing goes even further. And so writing a thank you note is just part of you know being human and appreciating what people are doing to help you out. The other thing, because most likely for them to write a good letter for you, that's going to take a couple, um, you know, 10 hours or more, depending on what research they decide to do. It's not just something they sit down and, and blurt out real quick if it's a good one. It takes more effort to do that. Um, also, this serves as a reminder for them. Teachers are so busy. Counselors are so busy. Sometimes they forget. And so writing a thank you note one week after you ask them, if they haven't started it, they'll, they'll say, oh yeah, 